Hello, I'm Ayana Thompson, the director of the Arizona Center for Medieval and Renaissance Studies, and it is my great pleasure and honor to welcome you to our distinguished lecture, Shakespeare and Indigeneity, a dialogue between Natalie Diaz, the internationally acclaimed poet, member of the Gila River Indian tribe and professor of English at ASU, Scott Stevens, the internationally acclaimed scholar, member of the Mohawk tribe and professor of English at Syracuse University, and Madeline Syatt, the internationally acclaimed director, member of the Mohegan tribe and executive director of the Yale Indigenous Performing Arts Program. I won't waste time by reading their amazing bios. They are all listed on our website and I encourage you to look them there. Look at them there. This event is being live captioned. If you wish to use this function, simply hit the CC button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, to live tweet today's event, feel free to use the hashtag ACMRS events. And if you'd like to pose a question to our experts, feel free to use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen at any point during the dialogue. If you'd like to support more events like this one, consider making a donation. Simply go to, I'm going to get it wrong. No, I got it. acmrs.asu.edu slash give. There's a long history of employing Shakespeare's texts and performances as part of a colonial weapon against indigenous Americans. One of the earliest histories of American theater includes an anecdote about nine chiefs from the Cherokee Nation being forced to endure a performance of Richard III in 1767 in New York. The chiefs were not impressed and they offered to do a dance the next night for the audience. And of course, Black Hawk, after being defeated in a war against Andrew Jackson, um, against Andrew Jackson's Indian removal scheme, was taken on a tour designed by Jackson to impress Black Hawk with the power of the United States. And part of this impressive tour was being forced to endure theater in New York again in 1833. But there's also a complex history of indigenous adaptation um, appropriation and reclamation of Shakespeare's texts, poems, and performances, including in the work of our three distinguished speakers. Natalie, Scott, and Maddie, I look forward to learning more about the tensions and convergences between Shakespeare and indigeneity from your discussion today. Thank you. Um, thanks, Diana. So the question that we're going to start off with um, for each of you uh, is, uh, how did you come to Shakespeare? What was your entry point? Uh, Scott, you look like you're thinking. You want to go first? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. Um, Sego, everyone, hello. Um, from Syracuse in the heart of Haudenosaunee country in upstate New York. Um, so how did I come to Shakespeare? I think very early um, with just the awareness that, so in our, in our family home, there was a floor to ceiling bookcase, just one built in bookcase in the living room. And most of it was populated with books that my mother had from college. You know, she had a couple, she's from the St. Regis Mohawk nation and she had two years of college that she was able to complete and she saved all her books, whether it was a French language textbook or an intro to American history. But among them was the complete works of Shakespeare. And I just remember looking at it as a kid, it seemed daunting because it was hundreds of pages long. And thinking of it, I, I, that bookshelf had <laughs> so much to do with the early formation of my interests. It's weird, it like imprinted on my mind like a baby chick or something. And, um, and because it was coming from my mother, it didn't seem foreign um, in that if it, you know, my dad was of Welsh American descent and um, didn't go to college, but it wasn't, I didn't associate it somehow with his kind of white background. It was something my mother brought into our home and into our lives and and liked and you would talk about plays she liked and so on so that was the first beyond i didn't know anything about it and i think the first time i actually saw 
a Shakespeare performance was actually the film, um, the Zeffirelli film, Romeo and Juliet. And I was probably about 12 and I was just mesmerized by it, by the language especially. So that's the earliest. Yeah, for, uh, for me, I my first uh, exposure to it was, um, I, I was a D1 athlete in college at Old Dominion University and um, Dr. Habib or Imtiaz Habib was my instructor and I didn't know, I didn't know who he was or I didn't know, um, you know, what kind of prowess he had in the field. And, uh, you know, but he was very kind to me because I, w I came in as an athlete having never read these things and I wasn't a poet then. So it was really my first, it was my first kind of uh, engagement with, with reading, reading, like really looking at a text and a language. And in some ways, it was probably the beginning of me returning to my, my Mojave language um, in, with that kind of care and attention. You know, it was an intellectual care for me with Shakespeare at that time. Uh, which led, of course, to then uh, a more kind of physical kind of care that I could take with language. And it really mattered to me that, that he was not white, um, one of my few instructors. And so he had a certain kind of street cred already. Um, and he had this very kind of dry cutting humor that would kind of put a lot of my classmates, uh, it, would, it would kind of tilt them a little bit. But it reminded me so much of my elders where he would say something and you, and you would have to wonder, was, is that a joke? Is that, you know, what, what is that? Um, and, and, you know, since I've realized, you know, all of the places Shakespeare is, but uh, there's a Shakespeare in New Mexico that's not far from here that is very tied to uh, indigeneity and the, the Inde or Apache and that kind of colonization there in Shakespeare. And also, uh, I learned like on a trip back from college that Lake Havasu City, which is very near to me, because I'm, I'm in uh, Makab Amatench right now. I'm, I'm on my reservation and uh, the Colorado River runs through here. And we have something we call a Lon the, the London Bridge. Mm -hmm. And it's touted as having actual stone from the London Bridge. And so we would joke at times that, you know, well, it was possible that Shakespeare walked over this and here I am walking <laughs> over it as well. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of my, you know, and then of course, like trying to engage with, with the poetry, you know, the sonnets are always something mm -hmm. all poets should have memorized or something. Um, however, it was the, the plays were where I kind of was able to see myself and in some ways through Dr. Habib. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's funny, I was just thinking of how, um, like, both of you just spoke about the, the sort of the, the coming to it part of the, the familiarity being around, like, other figures in your life that it was in relationship to. Um, it's just really interesting to me. I think also because I often, um, I finally, I think, outed myself recently that, that when I, I always like to say, like, my original relationship to Shakespeare began when my mom took me to see Shakespeare in the park when I was six and seven, and I really liked it. But actually, she was making this really good tuna macaroni salad. And I knew every time I would go, I would get this tuna macaroni salad. And so like my early, early relationship to Shakespeare was really like focused on getting a snack that I really liked, you know, and because I wanted to spend that time with my family. Um, so it's interesting sometimes the very early experiences like where the relationality actually like builds you into the actual connection of the poetry. Um, what are some of the ways that um, you're now, um, you know, in your sort of is, you know, incredibly established um, careers engaging um, with Shakespeare in either your art or your scholarship and the ways that you're thinking about it? Um, uh, part of it is I, I'm really invested in the notion and not just with Shakespeare but kind of early modern European culture and early modern indigenous culture that these things coexist and I like that notion, Natalie, of walking over London Bridge and maybe Shakespeare walked there too, <laughs> because our cultures are certainly vital and doing things at the same time as Shakespeare is alive and for better or for worse are sometimes even engaged with each other. I think of, you know, when Shakespeare's writing the sonnets in the 1590s, Europe had been in contact with the Americas for a hundred years. You know, it's not brand new anymore. It's a century old. And it's, yeah, it's an invasion. It's a collision. It's a cataclysm. But 
I've always resisted this notion that Europe brought early modernity to the new world. Early modernity is created mutually by that contact with each other and so on. And so I want students to be aware when we're talking about that literary period or historical period that native indigenous North Americans and Europeans are both players on this stage. And that, you know, in 1710, four Mohawk or three Mohawks and a Mohican from our community were taken to London and they watched Macbeth, you know, God knows what they made of it. And um, that Pocahontas in 1616 sees a Johnsonian mask, right, at court. And these are these kind of unexpected interconnections or early notions of intersectionality that I want our students to be aware that there's not this, it's not as incredibly foreign as it's made out to be, I guess. Yeah, and I mean, thinking about that as well, I, I find myself very engaged, uh, you know, quite naturally, I think, in thinking of indigeneity and being where we're located, but in ideas of, of migration mm -hmm. and, um, and how dangerous migration is to the, the establishment, um, even though they're being constantly shifted by it. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking a lot, like for me, one of the things I find with Shakespeare is uh, the ability to hold, or the willingness maybe to hold the tension of migration and especially in how that um, it, it kind of kept language moving in certain ways. And so, you know, I think indigenous language, you know, for many reasons is we assume it has stopped or we're always fighting for it. I mean, that's like one of my jobs, like of my life, not, you know, of my heart, not, not of the academy, but is, you know, trying to re-engage, trying to return to, trying to find ways to uh, share my indigenous language and in some ways we forget how embedded it is in the english language you know mm -hmm. and and thinking of of migration whether it was forced you know whether you were brought there and dropped off or whether you arrived there at your own wonder or wander mm -hmm. um just how much those migratory patterns made the language not not affected it but but made it and created it and for me one of the things I find in these texts is that that tension of language that feels really important to me, like knowing that this was breaking a language and, and in breaking, you know, these established languages, in some ways it was creating new knowledge centers, right? So normally we're used to like, even in terms of thinking of, um, you know, what literacy did, like who we think literacy like included everybody, but suddenly different divisions begin to happen with literacy and, and certain sensualities disappeared when we, you know, uh, leaned into to literacy. But thinking, you know, that the the English of Shakespeare, in some ways, uh, refused to be accessed by this, these hierarchies of language. You know, so the knowledge, in some ways, was was resisting or held away. And I think a lot about about that. Um, and one of the things, so uh, a text that I'm kind of toying with related to Shakespeare is uh, Winter Tale. And, but from, I, I first came to it through uh, Maurice Sendak's book, my brother's book. So this kind of wild retelling. Um, but again, it's, for me, it's, it's really about language. You know, like how do, I, how do I leap from that language and the tensions it holds? Like, especially the ways it breaks what is love or desire you know there is no right love or desire or the ones that are, are the ones that that end up being crushed and so in some ways um i think i'm also engaging on that level like what is the physicality of desire what is the violence of desire um and then where where do the small tendernesses happen that end up being you know grand resistances in some way mm -hmm. so um so uh, one of the things that uh, I think that you discussed, and it's also interesting to coming out of um, uh, Winter's Tale from my own relationship with Winter's Tale, um, is, uh, is this question of what can um, Shakespeare learn from Indigenous studies or what can, um, how can, how might the text benefit from, you know, Indigenous voices um, examining them and, and our sort of like theory and philosophy being applied to Shakespeare's texts? Uh, 
that's a great question. I think um, one of the areas I would go to is that 2007 performance of Macbeth and Clinkett um, put on by NMAI, but first put on in 2003 in Juno. And this was, you know, uh, Anita Maynard Loesch's um, work with the community. You know, she's non Lincoln speaker, but working with, closely with the community on all levels of how to both bring that story alive within that language, but also offer a, a non-Western critique to it. In that, you know, one of the very telling things they did was leave all the speeches of um, kind of overweening ambition and selfishness from Lady Macbeth and Macbeth in English mm -hmm. and anything that expressed a more community-based value system like the Clinkett one was in Clinkett, including when Lady Macbeth and Macbeth would lie and talk about, oh, they're concerned for Duncan or something. Then they would be speaking Clinkett because they were echoing at least deceptively um, something that was a value absolutely recognizable. And so I feel like there are cultural differences. It's not like they should go away. And I think if we highlight some of the indigenous ones um, from rooted in our own communities, I think that could bring a lot to it. It's not going to hurt the original. The original will stand, you know, it's doesn't, it's not gonna be faded or anything else, but it will bring another aspect to it, bring another cultural understanding and a whole way of thinking that because we're so used to talking about him as this universal genius. Mm -hmm. And there's certain aspects that I would say are universal, the power of language, the wisdom of stories. I can see that, but in terms of certain cultural values heavily inscribed, be they Christian or otherwise, they are different than most of our cultures, so. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, I mean, it's interesting even to consider what is the original. Yeah. Because in yeah. some ways they're very much like native stories. It's like, yeah. that's, no, that's my song. No, wait, that's, that's my uncle's song. No, that, you know, uh, that's my family song. And so kind of thinking about that shift. Um, I, I also, I mean, in thinking about Macbeth a little bit, I, I mean, one of the things I feel that that feels important about the conversation back. You know, we're seeing all these like climate change and all these conversations, but in some ways where Shakespeare's work was holding or that language, that story, like one of the places it was, it was holding uh, a light to or holding its hands to was that it, it seemed to me like a realization of, of a certain kind of dislocation, right? So like, the city was becoming itself in terrible ways, you know? Um, and so for me, like that, those kind of relationship with, with the land, like, you know, even the idea of trying to like consider the life as being a lease of land or trying to kind of make that connection and, and watching the struggle of that and realizing that, you know, or one realization that I applied to it is that there was no language for that because they were, there were suddenly different fights that I'm not even sure they understood because it had been so dislocated from a relationship with land. And that, I feel like that's kind of sprinkled through all of the work, you know, and, and maybe even considering, uh, you know, his, assuming we're talking about one person or, but the, their struggles with lands and, uh, you know, estates and things like that. And, and I'm thinking of uh, especially the idea of like the copy, like how that comes up there and like, you know, is it the body that's the copy of the land or is it, you know, this power where suddenly the land becomes a, uh, an imitation or iteration of, of the copy, which is the body. And so one of the ways that I think about bringing that into an indigenous space and letting, you know, I don't know about indigenizing it per se, because I do, I do think there are some things that that don't translate and should never, you know, or that like certain knowledges that are not theirs and, and, you know, are ours in some way. But I think creating that conversation, I think especially because not even so much thinking about the play, but the entire body of study 
-hmm. I mean, it's such a giant body of, of study in the academy. And I feel like there's so many pages devoted to it and it feels necessary to bring it into these indigenous spaces and see where it fails. Mm -hmm. You know, as like, you know, some of what Scott was saying and, and to see where like, yeah, we don't bring that into this value system. One, because our value system just consumes it, right? Like mm -hmm. whether with care or relationality or, or something. And so for me, like uh, that's something I'm, I'm really wondering about. And part of this wonder has come simply with Ayana being on our campus and the work that she's doing, because I have never had the, the gift or the generosity of suddenly returning to wonder about Shakespeare other than in these small ways but it's returned me to some of the original questions for me. And in some ways it was always trying to see myself in it. Mm. You know, like I, I, I was going through my original text um, a few days ago and just all of the words I circled were related to land, you know? And so even then I was trying to like, you know, land back in Shakespeare or something. Yeah. I love this notion, I love this notion of land that you're bringing up um, right now, Natalie, because it, it makes, you know, it's one times you, you hear an idea that's really generative and you think of it from an indigenous perspective. And that would be a great exercise to turn one's focus in Shakespeare studies on the notion of the pastoral as a motif, but from an indigenous concept of land, because obviously there's a kind of elegiac quality about the pastoral early on about losing that relationship to the land and the switch to urban and the urban world, the big town. And so that it's exactly the type of fruitful kind of intersection that I think it could bring about. Right? Yeah, and like the danger, right, of the pastoral and why we have the anti-pastoral or the right. dark pastoral right. be because it's so closely tied to patriotism. Mm. Uh, Helen MacDonald, a writer um, from the UK has written a book about uh, Martins recently, it does a lot like out in the, in the land with the natural, you know, elements and uh, non-human life. And um, was recently talking about that, that link between what is the natural world and, and how immediately it has a certain kind of patriotism to it. And so even that idea that to, to go back and tell a story in the land or with the land or, you know, the wild west, the frontier, like there's something very uh, masculine and, and empirical about that. Uh, ability to conquer and so thinking too about that like you know the danger of nostalgia and how those things operate and it, yeah and I mean I still I feel like I keep flipping and, and and turning the argument over and over and over on its head but you know I I think there's something about the pastoral that is actually uh late right it's I mean it's late and it's um it's still too new and I think that's a really interesting uh, conversation or relationship to try to pull back into some of, uh, of the native community spaces. You know, be, like, how do you speak about the land when there is no nostalgia for it? Mm -hmm. Or when you are not made nation by it, but you're made body by it, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think that's like a really generous space um, that I'll be thinking and bouncing off of, of the question and what Scott just said. One of the, um, just to keep building on this, one of the things, uh, before, before I switch back to totally being just a theater person, um, one of the things that I was looking at <laughs> academically a lot um, was, uh, <laughs> was actually, um, you know, for, for, for all of this time, you know, they've come and they've taken their, their Western Eurocentric literary theory and they've applied it to our work. But what is it, what is it then, right? When we actually take our ideas and our philosophies and we, we look at Shakespeare through it. And in performance, I feel like, um, it's that that's actually like very fun, right? Because like even in the case of um, directing a play, you can find just a couple of phrases and sort of like mind those phrases for um, all of the things they could mean about the world, um, whether it be something where it does have an aspect of the pastoral. Um, when I directed Winter's Tale, honestly, the entire sort of thinking about the production just came from the line uh, about the bear. They're never um, they're never cursed, but when they're hungry. Um, because we were like, well, why is the bear hungry? Like, you know, we got to go into like the fact that the bear is hungry and that means something very bad about this world um, that we need to heal from. Um, and that can be true in any of them, you know, like all of the, all of the indigenous Macbeths that I, that I know about tend to deal with some aspect of, 
of there being there being some conversation with the colonial within it because there is that darkness and there is that that bad medicine operating within that play and so it's it's a cure it's a curiosity of mine um like what are if any um lines and moments in the plays that that have like resonated with you from like beyond um sort of Shakespeare's world and into your own in potentially deeper ways. It's like a hard and deep question also. So I'm gonna like leave some air for it. Yeah, I, I, I don't know immediately one, you know, line. I'm gonna look through my book. Comes from my <laughs> it's like a pop quiz, uh, sorry. But um, I, I just think there, you know, there are certain aspects of the plays um, that I'm always drawn to, whether it be um, some kind of either a meta drama moment of a play within a play or just mm -hmm. storytelling within the play, because I, I'm always interested in the, the notion of the wisdom of stories and that that's part of where I feel that there's an interconnection between indigenous cultures and Shakespeare. Um, because as Natalie was saying, whatever the original is, I mean, he's borrowing plots and stories from other people that are borrowing them from other people, but it's the telling of it, right? Just as it would be with any of our members of our community that are expert storytellers and they convey a certain wisdom in the telling that's extremely careful of language and its nuance and power. And I remember just anecdotally, one of my, um, dear late colleagues from my days at SUNY Buffalo, uh, this indigenous scholar, John Mohawk, we were in a meeting and a dean was talking to us and the dean was from the sciences, of course, and um, telling us that we were um, too interested in knowledge production and he was more interested in information. And John leaned over to me and he said, boy, I feel pretty bad for wisdom right now. You know, like that was <laughs> not a term that could be even thought of somehow within the academy. And I find <laughs> the, the wisdom of stories and the wisdom in, in Shakespeare is what, you know, is as maybe plummy and old fashioned as that may sound to people, that's what resonates to me. And so I'm always fascinated by those moments of storytelling, you know, um, whether it's in the winter's tale and the, um, boy wants to hear a story, et cetera. Um, so those type of things come to mind. Yeah, I, when, I, when I first begin like engaging with it in college, um, I, I was very much, you know, looking for all the queer parts and, and mm -hmm. then trying to figure out because I didn't have the, I didn't have the theater aesthetic lexicon of like, you know, to be, costumed or clothed or masked, but I, it was always just those really queered moments that in some ways reminded me, I mean, I was an athlete, I grew up on the reservation. I didn't have a lot of like gender placed on me. It, it, we all know each other. And so in some ways the knowing uh, supersedes the language maybe. And so I had never, I had never encountered the language of queerness outside of my reservation, even as an athlete until I got to college. But I think through through the different um, through the different plays, that was always something, and even in, in the sonnets, especially. But always just looking for those moments of um, of like transformation, not just with like what is what is gender or you know what I might be able to read in as is this subversive or is this submissive to this you know structure. Um, but I think just also those moments of transformation felt really important. And even thinking of uh, the bear and for us, like, you know, what is Ursa Major? Like mm -hmm. it's one of our stars. I think we all like, you know, it's, it's probably all of our stars. Like, you know, we would all fight. Well, no, this one came from our story, you know, but, um, but just kind of thinking about that and, you know, even knowing like that the bear might've come from a, another story before that, you know, which was maybe a punishment for a woman or, um, you know, for some sort of infidelity. But I think just those moments like um, where, where there's a transformation of, of body that felt very natural to me. So I was always trying to lift them out, you know, mm -hmm. like a transformation that could happen, you know, a, 
uh, a brother not recognizing the sister because it's a brother and then seeing themselves in it or, you know, um, what those things meant. And so I was always like, just overly underlining and, you know, just being a strange queer Indian in Shakespeare texts, but. I think but I when I also think of lines that I'll say or come back to me, not even really thinking of them as Shakespeare lines, but they've been with me for a long time. Um, in Lear, when he says, look with thine ears, you know, and that notion of, because obviously Gloucester's blind, but he's saying, you know, look with thine ears. And then he goes on with this talk about justice and so on. And another is um, in Troilus and Cressida when he says, um, you know, oh, bifold authority and this notion of the duplicity of power and of, like, God, that's never left us, you know? <laughs> and um, I can think, oh, bifold authority on so many levels um, about knowing, about actual authority, about power, etc., cetera. And um, it's just like those little phrases that stick in the head, you carry them with you and they're sometimes alienated from the source, but they're with me, you know. That's, a, that's an interesting, uh, that's like an, I think it's an interesting thing uh, to bring up in conversation with Shakespeare, the way that there are aspects of it, right, that sit outside of relationality to the actual writer in some ways. Um, they've become something uh, sort of like of their own in the culture and in sort of the mindset of people generally, which I think is, is part of what makes it so exciting when we are able to do things like, um, you know, have, have productions that are in our own native languages um, and really like, you know, use them as ways of like, um, bringing things uh, to our communities that are important to us instead of having to serve a playwright who isn't necessarily uh, present or or even necessarily interested in what it is that we're doing at this juncture. Um, so um, so I, I'm also really interested in something that you, you, you've you both brought up a little bit about um, some of the ways in which you see uh, Shakespeare and the way that every single time a story is told uh, it, it's told differently, it's told for that audience, right? That it's, it's Shakespeare played at any given moment in time is, is completely different depending on how it's being interpreted as, as sort of, uh, and staged and changed and cut and as, as sort of similar to, to traditional storytelling in that um, it, is, it is shifting in relationship with the community. Has there ever been an instance of, and I think you mentioned this with, with the clink at Macbeth, um, of, of a moment where you've encountered Shakespeare in relationship to a moment in time that felt significant? And if not, then I have questions from the audience that I can move to. Well, I mean, uh, just to go back, um, partly the clink at Macbeth was a real eye opener to me because um, of the possibilities, you know, that I, I thought it showed, but also the, um, the still the love of the language of the, the English text as well, which is, you know, amazing stuff as poetry. So um, I, I just thought that there was a real way of, if not indigenizing, that may be a too easy a claim, but of, I like the notion of reclamation. And so of reclaiming it, reclaiming the aspects that resonate within our communities. Um, I, it, it seemed incredibly fruitful to me when I saw that. So it wasn't about the necessarily the historic moment in time, but it was just the, the newness of it to me. And for me, other than, I mean, I've only seen, I've seen two plays, like actual plays. Otherwise I just read and sit in the language, but they both were in the Rogue Valley Hmm. Uh, they do like a Shakespeare festival there, but I was there as a, a writer and that's where I first picked up the Syndac book, book because the, the play was on and I, I felt like I had to go um, because these people were being very nice and they paid me a lot of money to come and read poems and then they were so excited that they bought these tickets and they told me how much their tickets cost and, um, and it, that was like an interesting relationship because I was I mean, I write, a, I write a lot about family that are not my actual, you know, family members, but some representation of them. And there was, you know, that was kind of a moment when it, like, it opened up something for me in relationship to the ways I can 
relate to my own family through some of those texts. Mm -hmm. And so, and you know, it's strange because I grew up in story. My mother tells stories like we're, you know, but it was, there was something about being in the middle of this place when the, all of the leaves were changing. I'd never seen anything like it. And, you know, this, in, this kind of crazy theater, like the whole town is basically built around these plays. Um, and it was a, um, all a person of color cast and there were a couple um, deaf uh, um, actors. Mm -hmm. And so there, there was just, I don't know, all of the pieces were kind of in the right place um, to, to be separate enough that things were new in a different way. Um, and it was, it was a strangely like emotional place because I don't know that I normally feel emotional in Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. You know, I think there's too much happening for me to kind of pay attention to, but. Yeah, this, I mean, this is, this, um, some things I'm really just excited about in this conversation so far are just, um, I think some of the ways of the thinking that, that you're both bringing so graciously um, to the text. I feel like recently my, my relationship to it has, has gotten a little volatile lately as I've become, you know, more and more aware of the fact that there's, there's a kind of intentionality societally in the fact that uh, I, you know, encountered Shakespeare regularly um, throughout my youth, but, you know, there's no opportunity to engage in Native theater. Um, and a lot of that has to do with historically the way that Shakespeare has been supported and funded and put into schools um, in, a, in a sort of required way in this country while um, our, our languages and stories have been devalued and intentionally um, uh, pushed to the side. So, um, so, so I feel like the opportunities to, to really um, look at these things um, from our perspectives is just so empowering because it, it enables us to, to take something back. And I'll never forget finding out that there was a production of A Midsummer Night's Dream in 1923 at, um, at Haskell Indian School that was directed by um, uh, Ella Deloria and Ruth Muskrat Bronson, two of the only native professors at the school at the time, where it was a performance, right? Where it was like, we're gonna, instead of just teaching this, we're gonna do a production. And I like, I keep wishing I knew what had gone on in that production, you know, cause, cause they were known for being able to like, um, you know, like not just indoctrinate students, right? But merge the culture into the things that they had to teach. And so that's just been something like, I've just, I, you know, there's not, there's not like, I haven't found any secret documentation yet of this performance, but if anyone ever does, um, you let me know. Uh, so I'm gonna move. We'll redo it. have to redo yeah. it now. Uh, so we'll redo it. The 1923 uh, Native Midsummer. <laughs> um, uh, so I'm gonna move into some of the questions from our wonderful audience um, who are listening in and just so excited uh, to hear more from you. So, uh, which uh, oh gosh, <laughs> which popular Shakespeare play in your thinking is sort of uh, the most, uh, I guess distant from from uh, your sort of like either your nation specific ways of being or what you see as indigenous ways of being. But yeah, in the world and why. I, I mean, I think they all are. Mm -hmm. um, and it doesn't mean I can't find relationship to them. You know, language is that it's that energy that that we use story is that um, and again, where I feel the large differences are in that dislocation and, and therefore turmoil, right, in, um, in, in the, the characters or the peoples who are in the plays with just that dislocation, you know, like the land becomes wild. You have to go out to the land to have the dream, you know, um, you know, whether we're thinking about, you know, Caliban, I feel like that's the, we all get kind of, everything is Caliban. Everything. Now that that's not important, but come on, you know, right. um, I think, I mean, I think the Duke and As You Like It is, is sounds pretty native when he's talking yeah. about the books and the streams, right? Or like, although like Trump said something about ballots and lakes recently or streams so maybe yeah i don't that that kept pop when when that happened last night i don't mean to talk about the debate but when that happened when he said something about ballots and creeks that's what i was thinking i was thinking about that as you like it moment where the stones are speaking and the books are in the streams but anyhow i'm yeah, that was an no, answer so that's no that's <laughs> actually great because i was actually thinking about as you like it recently because um of, of like 
thinking about which of the plays have ways that I think of as like still showing us how to like live well, you know, in them. And I feel like the Duke, he's got something going on in the woods. <laughs> but, uh. I think um, in terms of alien to me from native culture, um, probably the histories to me seems harder to relate, not in, in some of the details of them, in terms of human interactions, no, but I get caught up in the historicity of them as English things. And, um, and so I, I drift away from um, a kind of cultural critique to a kind of, you know, belated new historicist critique or something like that. So I, but um, I feel like all the tragedies are relatable in a certain way. Um, but I, I think, yeah, some of the, you know, like, Henry, you know, four part two or something like I, I don't know. <laughs> um, I'd have to really look at it closely, but yeah. yeah. Well, and the one way they relate is that they all have a land acknowledgement in the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> Tell you exactly where they're at or where they've come. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, we've got some very complex questions from this audience. So um I'm feeling, I'm feeling these academic vibes. Uh, all right, so are the responsibilities of non-Indigenous scholars reading for Indigenous values in Shakespeare different from the responsibilities of non-Black scholars reading Blackness in Shakespeare? I don't know what are the, I think it's also a tricky question because like, I, I don't know that, that each of us could necessarily speak to what the responsibilities of non-Black scholars reading Blackness in Shakespeare ought to be as folks who are not Black, um, and that this entire kind of question has a lot of, um, there's multiple questions on here about, about from an academic framework, I think being able to read into other people's perspectives. Um, and, and I think I'm just gonna, I'm gonna leave it to both of you because I personally am not experienced in trying to read from other people's perspectives as a sort of um, way of being, but as, as folks who engage with Indigenous studies in the academy, I feel like that's probably something you encounter uh, regularly. Yeah, um, it's, this is a, a difficult question, partly because there's always for me the kind of the bind of not wanting to create one monolithic Indigenous culture, like, well, that's not a very Indigenous. Um, and at the same time, so I always say to students, like, we're as diverse a group of nations as Africa or Europe or any continent, right? Um, that Haudenosaunee culture is not the same as Diné culture, as Estonian culture is not the same as Portuguese culture. Mm -hmm. But um, that said, we also do share one great collective common aspect and that is the experience of colonialism of settler colonialism. Yeah. The one thing where I can hear stories from people in the Northwest Coast or people in Southern Florida, indigenous people and think, I know this story. I've felt this story among our community or so on, is around that experience, of course. Um, so I think there's that aspect that one has to be mindful of both our diversity and the things that we do have in common. I have found myself at other times making a claim in class, um, not on a, in a Shakespeare class, that something seems really non-Indigenous to me. So when I was visiting the University of Wyoming one time on their, the building for geology and mining and things like this, um, not surprisingly, <laughs> um, it said in stone above the door, and it was an old historic building, something along the lines, I'm paraphrasing, the control of nature is earned, not given. I thought there is the non-indigenous thought, the control of nature, like who the, what the, um, where I could just say blanketly, I know of no indigenous nation mm -hmm. that um, comes at the relationship to the land, to nature, um, the distinction between us and nature. Um, I just, that notion of, you know, be fruitful and multiply and have dominion over the earth and rule all things, that seems really non-Indigenous in a blanket way. And so that I think can be taught by anyone. 
that the, you know there are these sentiments, but I can't. I agree with you, Madeline, that I I would be very leery of trying to take on someone else's perspective to interpret something. I have a follow up question. It's about this too. I mean, would they be better off considering like potentially like applying existing native literary theory to a text or something that is like an idea that is specific and how that might, I don't know how these sort of conversations work within the academy or would that still fall into the same pattern of them then trying to, I, I don't actually. I, I mean, I, I don't know, maybe, maybe Natalie has a better yeah. sense of how it sounds. Natalie, take it away. <laughs> well, I mean, I think in the question, I'm wondering like how active perspective is working mm. in that question because I think, I mean, I think there's a an out of timeness that we're working in. So for you to, for me to take any text and imagine it having not evolved to the time I'm in, mm -hmm. in terms of critiquing it, in terms of, like, it's no, it's not the same text, right? And, and the text is always dependent on its audience, you know, except for apparently the constitution. But anyhow, the, the like the text apparent, like, you know, so I think that is something to me, like, hmm. I think maybe the primary problem is that you would have to take an indigenous perspective from outside and drop it in. Like, if that was the case, like, bring in indigenous texts, bring in, you know, hmm. so I guess I, I guess I, I can't hold that question because those things don't necessarily happen in my relationality to, to the text. But. That makes sense. Um, there's a quick question. I'm going to, I'm going to, there's one question. I'm just going to answer my opinion on really quickly. I don't know if you have, it's a very theater oriented question. So if you have thoughts, jump in, but it was, should native actors include Shakespeare in their training? And if so, how important is it to theater training? My like quick brief thing on that is, um, something we've been talking about a lot is like include Shakespeare, but not first, um, let them develop their own voice and then let Shakespeare be a part of their training because of the fact that Shakespeare is the most produced playwright in America. And so if an actor wants to have a career, it can be useful to them, but make, but that, but create the circumstances in which as they're, as, as folks are training, that they're not colonizing their voice at the beginning of the process. Um, because that I think can be very damaging, uh, to, to sort of the empowerment of native actors in the field. But I do think that being able to work in as many venues as possible, especially when theater companies like Oregon Shakespeare Festival are casting, you know, like someone in Manahata who is then also in the Shakespeare play, that versatility of talents and knowing that, you know, we have native actors who can do everything is so important because that's how we're bringing our perspectives to all of these spaces is by saying that there's not just one thing we can do, we can do everything. So, you know, that I think that applies to Shakespeare, but I think that applies to, you know, um, to, to theater across the board. Um, so I'm going to get rid of this question now. It's gone. <laughs> Done. Um, do you have, if you have any of you have anything to add to that? Okay, great. Um, uh, I'm interested in, uh... guys, these questions are so hard. Um, so a lot of the questions that are, that are here, I'm just going to say, they, they involve similar things to that first question in terms of, um, what Shakespeare to read to create more mindfulness of indigeneity, but I sort of feel like they should just read Natalie Diaz's work and say, you know, like there's this weird um, conversation around Shakespeare becoming this um, placeholder for so many things. Um, and I'm not, I'm not sure that, uh, I don't know what you all think, but I, I'm not sure what your opinion is on sort of the idea that Shakespeare should fill so much space in terms of the conversations around um, indigeneity. I mean, do you think that, do you think, for example, that Indigenous Studies course could be taught through Shakespeare, or do you think it's better for them to read, you know, other, other things? But, I mean, in some ways, it's like wondering why McDonald's doesn't have fried bread. <laughs> like, I mean, I'm, not, I'm, I'm just being a little silly, but, but you know what I mean? Like, Shakespeare is Shakespeare. Yeah. And it doesn't mean, like you were saying, we can't be actors in it or instructors in it or find ourselves in it the way we would in any story. I mean, we live in America, like every single day we are in a structure that we didn't imagine, but we're very capable of reimagining it or imagining ourselves in it or actuating that imagination. And so I, you know, I, I guess my simple answer would just be that, like, I don't, yeah, like Shakespeare is is Shakespeare, 
and uh, a play of Shakespeare is something different mm -hmm. because we're looking at actors and, mm -hmm. and a story. But in terms of, of, you know, yeah, I mean, you will never, Shakespeare will never be native, but natives will like, as you're doing, right. And, uh, you know, as Scott's doing, like mm -hmm. engaging with it in a very hands-on way. So it is an other thing, a new thing as much as it is also itself. So, yeah, I'm gonna start like moonwalking backward in that question. So no, it was I was looking at this and it was like that, that some of the questions were actually about like what Shakespeare should be taught to help people understand indigeneity. And I was like, well, like if we're talking about indigeneity to England, then like that's a different conversation. But if we're talking, about, you know, it, it it's a little Scott. You look like you're having some deep thoughts. Well, I'm just thinking. Yeah, I, I couldn't say to teach indigeneity through Shakespeare, but yeah. um, I would. I, I'm just kind of consistently interested in, in these intersections that are always unexpected, but that make it clear that Shakespeare has something to do with indigenous lives and history. And so, yeah, there's, I love to hear about the moment at Haskell when they're doing, was it Midsummer Night's Dream, you said? And um, I found when I was looking at um, some Carlisle New, you know, yep, they have there's the, a student, uh, student the yeah. arrow. Um, well, there's a student named William Shakespeare that attends a Rappahoe student, but also, um, you know, at one point there's a Dr. Richmond there who tells the students, and it's reported in the paper that next to the Bible, the most important thing is Shakespeare. Yeah. Well, that has a heavy, you know, oh. that's, that's doing something kind of. I kind of lowered the the right. worth of it. <laughs> That ends, up, then, that ends up being what happens with Shakespeare in America. It ends up sort of replacing the Bible, becoming that sort of text yeah, that is everything. Right, and that's, and that's about nationalism and assimilation and things like this as well. And that should be, that information should be engaged. As, it's not the only story, but it's part of the story. So that not surprisingly in 1916, at the tercentenary of Shakespeare's death, like everywhere else in the United States, Carlisle put on a Shakespeare festival mm -hmm. and it lists who reads what parts and what the, all the given speeches. You better believe the quality of mercy is in there and mm -hmm. a variety, you know, all the kind of Bradley play chestnuts are brought out and recited and there's recitation, but that's part of indigenous history too, right? And, and I'm not saying that that was even necessarily a violent thing or something, but it's part of a program. And so I think it would be useful to have students just be aware that it's not just about the beauty of Shakespeare either, that it's, you know, someone saw it as something that could be weaponized and someone else saw it that some could be profoundly inspirational and guide one to a love of language. Mm. So. Yeah. Yeah, and also that those productions that we get so excited about when they start, um, you know, uh, translating Shakespeare into indigenous languages are then part of that very long cycle, that cycle of violence, right? Of the removal of the languages and Shakespeare being a part of that and then having to get back to actually being able to speak our languages alongside those um, is actually not just like a, a nice, you know, artistic gesture, but it's actually part of a really important um, cycle of repatriation. Yeah, and I mean, it's letting it evolve, right? Like Shakespeare took these stories from other people mm -hmm. and. And, you know, it's, it's letting language evolve. And that's what colonialism has worked so hard to, to do is to stop language from having an imagination and be, so that we can exist, you know, within it. And I mean, in terms of like, so the language work I do, um, acting and the stage, I think are, are one of the, like some of the best ways to learn a language you know, and that's like kind of what story story was. And so there's there's also, I think, that element of it. Um, yeah, and letting it be active, like the same thing it was for for the audience then, it can also be for us, like it changed some of the English language, like all of those theaters. And mm -hmm. in, the, you know, in the same way, like it affects our indigenous languages when we actuate them, you know, on a stage, for example, or in a play. Definitely. Um, okay, let's do, whoa, whoa, there's so many new ones in here. All right, sorry. Uh, <laughs> um, 
I'm like so aware that some of these questions are coming from very, very, very good academics because like it takes me two reads on them. Um, hang on a second, I'm gonna scroll. Uh, oh, interesting. Um, uh, one of the questions, I don't know if, if either of you has an answer to this, would you recommend primary documents students could read alongside Shakespeare to help them better understand colonization during the time he was writing? I, I know, I mean, Scott may have primary, but yeah. I mean, there are like people like Tommy Orange, you know, who are writing uh, in prose and fiction, and there are many, you know, poets, you know, who are, who are engaging, engaging with language, engaging with texts, and, you know, the work Lady Long Soldier does with historical documents, not, you wouldn't necessarily link them to Shakespeare, but I also think, you know, again, like you have to, I feel like you, it's language. So in some ways we pin it to time, but it's out of time. It's a story. And if we treat it like a, a story and let all of those things happen, which is like reflection of and speaking toward society and peoples and religions and all these value systems, then, I mean, I, and again, I just, I'm not a Shakespeare scholar. I'm a poet, which I get away with lots of things because of that, but I can't imagine reading any text not alongside other things that are happening uh, now. Um, yeah, I, I was just, if I understood the question, I, I thought, are there primary from Shakespeare's period? Do you I, mean? think, I, think, I think, but this is, I think, actually a really good question to engage with, um, is, is the difference between those two things and why they're, they're both equally important, right? So the yeah, question- I like very that, much what, what um, Natalie's proposing from an indigenous perspective, but, yeah, I think that um, there are probably a number of texts. Um, often they're printed in these scholarly editions of certain plays, you know, whether it be look at Montaigne's essays, on, essay on cannibals or on coaches and the new world and so on, to look at different notions of what colonialism was in Shakespeare's time, since he seems not that specifically engaged in it outside of what we can kind of extrapolate from the the Tempest. But I think there's plenty of those original texts about plans for the colonization of the Americas from the period that make kind of chillingly explicit the goals of the colonial regime, which is, you know, to reduce them to settlements on the land. And this language like that, it's 17th century, but it's it's something students should be aware is is not a mystery that it was it was planned. Wow, thank you. This was amazing. I have like pages and pages of notes. <laughs> uh, thank you for your wisdom, um, for your deep engagement with language and storytelling. Um, and I would also put in a plug for Hacklet's Principal Navigations if anyone's wanting some, <laughs> you know, talk about chilling tales of, of uh, encounter uh, that goes well with any Shakespeare. Um, Maddie, Natalie, Scott, uh, Blessings and thank you. Gracias. Yeah. Yahweh. Thank you.